So this was in rural China at the, the markets, um, so population of around 2 million people which is you know, quite big for coming from New Zealand still for a city but um, you know, very rural in terms of from China's point of view. So we're trying to buy some, uh, some vegetables, um, you know, just your standard market, hand over some uh, some Chinese yuan um, and not, not accepted. Um, the only payment method that, that this chat preferred was actually on a mobile phone, uh, either WeChat or Alipay. Um, coming from a, a country where uh, credit card um, or, or cash, we're you know, very much a cash society still um, in New Zealand, uh, this, was, this was very different for me. Um, and eventually he did accept our cash, but it was at a premium, we had to pay more, almost like a service fee. So it was cheaper to pay by the mobile app. So that for me was a, was a real light bulb moment. If they're doing this in the markets in rural China, how come we're not doing this in our Western you know, cultures in New Zealand where you know, everyone's got access to, to mobile phones? Um, so firstly, I guess just I do want to cover off a little bit about you know, why someone who knew absolutely nothing about technology um, went on to, a t to cover a topic uh, looking at online selling. Um, I'll touch on a few insights that I found from my travels and then some recommendations that um, anyone from, from on-farm or um, agri-processors can, can utilise to, to get a premium for their products. So this was a, a quote that sort of resonated with me a little bit heading off on my Nuffield journey. So I actually initially I headed off um, looking at how we could sort of attract more, more staff to the farm. Um, we heard a little bit about that yesterday. Uh, but one of the things that kept coming up in the conversations was you know, the returns on farm you know, weren't good enough, they weren't stable, um, and that's why I didn't really see a career as a farmer. And we'd just been through a, a couple of real low payouts on the home farm, um, and it was part of the reason I was working off farm as well. Uh, I certainly didn't, you know, would have to, have to take a, a pretty big pay cut and a lot of risk to go back onto the family farm. Um, so this is, I sort of set out really broad and then it was my light bulb moment that got me to really focus on the, the online selling. This was a, uh, a little bit of a um, a paper, a research paper done by KPMG on New Zealand uh, in 2016 which just showed uh, how much our sort of export receipts were. So this is not on the farm gate, this is leaving New Zealand. Um, so that the actual farm return was a lot less and then what those products were estimated to be selling for um, in the end market. So it was envisioned that New Zealand was capturing less than 15%. So I wanted to set out and see, you know, could we actually capture more of this? Um, was there an opportunity or were we actually doing pretty good in, in getting 15% of, of those, export, uh, those products final value? Um, so I settled on you know, online selling and specifically uh, mobile selling, so mobile e-commerce. And what I found is you know, everyone around the world, whether it be um, in Asia, in Africa, um, Western cultures, everyone's got mobile phones and specifically smartphones. Um, and they're all doing everything on their phones. They're very time poor, um, they really want to, and mobile payments, obviously, which I've, I've talked about, is why they're doing everything on their, on their phones. So as you can see, that, you know, they're paying for stuff, they're communicating, they're ordering food, products, clothes, um, and getting all their, their news, whether that be truthful or, or fake news, um, on their mobile phones. Uh, some of the statistics as well that were you know, coming out of mobile use, particularly um, in, so China is New Zealand's um, biggest market. Obviously we had a free trade agreement there, so that's our biggest market, particularly for dairy. Um, and these are some of the stats. So this is how many people have bought at least a grocery item on their mobile phone in the last year. Uh, this is 2017 statistics. Um, so as you can see the, the global average is about 34%, uh, Western culture, Britain 30, 35% and then you know, India and China which are emerging economies, um, they are doing a lot more on their mobile phones than we are. And that's something that I know New Zealanders and I'm, I'm sure Australians have been guilty of as well as we quite often um, sell our products how we like to buy our products um, rather than actually how our consumers are purchasing products. Um, so New Zealand it's about 21%. I haven't got a statistic on Australia but having been here for a few days uh, with my wife Christina, um, I think you guys will be a lot higher than, than that global average here as well. 
Um, one of the other insights I found was uh, you hear a lot of, we heard you say about Amazon and Alibaba and, and it's, it's almost becoming a bit of a battle between these two giants um, in the market and I'm going to talk a little bit about this in my recommendations but you know, Alibaba and Amazon are now in Australia, Alibaba's in New Zealand as well um, so they're, they're buying down the supply chain and actually getting almost to the, to the farm gate so they are you know, creating that security um, but there's also you know, they are then commoditizing those products as well um, in terms of that. One of the other insights, and this is one I got huge pushback on in New Zealand, was that you know, why are you looking at online selling? We're predominantly in the business-to-business -business space. Um, we're not in the business-to-consumer space. We're not direct to our, our consumers, so we don't need to be worrying about this. And what I soon found was that you know, Alibaba.com, for example, was a, the original website, Alibaba.com, is a business-to-business -business website. Um, very much, you know, the business to business interactions are very much going similar to, to consumers. And a lot of people who, you know, in their personal lives, they're using a mobile phone, um, they're doing everything on their mobile phone, they want to then go to work and they don't want to then have to go back to using a computer or using paper or anything like that or, or even talking to people. They want to be able to just do that all on their mobile phone. Um, another insight, and I imagine you know, I have seen a few empty shops around Melbourne as well. Um, an insight coming out of New Zealand was that you know, retail was, was dead. The bricks and mortar of retail was dead. You know, online was sort of competing and taking over. And you know, that was going to be a huge detriment to, you know, if you buy online, you're not going to support local. Uh, what I actually found is that bricks and mortar is, is making a huge comeback. Um, you know, especially through Southeast Asia, China, um, Japan, those countries, they, they are very much so. Alibaba's buying up supermarkets all the time. JD.com, one of their big competitors, is doing, doing exactly the same. So there's been a real resurgence of this bricks and mortar retail. Um, it's just different. And the reason for it's different is just look, if we look at um, the buying journey. So Previously, you know, you built awareness by effectively, you know, reading print, watching TV, there'd be ads, there'd be those sorts of things, and then you'd talk to your friends, you'd, you know, we do it on farm, you talk to the neighbour to get consideration, get that word of mouth around products, you evaluated in store, you purchased it in store, and then you consumed and repeated it through store, and then when you advocated a product, it was word of mouth, you'd tell your friends. What's happening now is it's all moved online, so, you know, the awareness side is very much the social social media, Instagram, Facebook, um, but here's where it's sort of changed recently, so it did go all online but it's coming back as people now still want to consider and evaluate products um, in store, so they're, they're going back to supermarkets to have a look to, you know, to taste some Australian lamb or um, try some kangaroo or something like that, they want to try it first and then if they like it, you know, evaluate it, they'll then purchase it, but even if they're at the supermarket they won't purchase it there and then, they'll purchase it on their phone and it'll be at home waiting for them by the time they get home. They'll then repeat and consume on their phone and obviously the advocacy, they'll talk about it on social media and that's how you're starting to build that brand. So just some examples of some of the, the technology as well that's helping, you know, that they're scanning and they're attract, attracting of a price. So this is, um, you know, blockchain. Don't ask me about blockchain. I think there's other scholars, Matt Furley, um, he can talk to you about blockchain. But this is an example in Beijing. Uh, this is a, a bit of beef out of Inner Mongolia. And what you're doing is you're scanning that barcode and it's telling you um, that it's a Charolais, uh, the farm it's come from, which is just a farm number. So farmers... Um, farmer, whatever that number is up there, uh, what cut it is, uh, how many antibiotic treatments that animal got and when they got them, if it got vaccinated, um, what, uh, what diet it had, so in this case it's been fed lucerne, hay and I think some soy. It has said when it's left the farm, what, um, what time it was killed, what uh, what that meat's been tested for in terms of, you know, in Australia, that food safety, so tested for antibiotics, tested for all those growth hormones, um, and then how long it's got to to get to the market. And that's selling for an 80% premium in the supermarkets. And it's not even really a great story. I mean, you imagine if that said, um, you know, Stuart Tate's farm, it had a video of Stu talking about his farm and why he farmed. It was, um, you know, purebred Angus, grass-fed, and that could prove all that. So I think there's some real opportunity there to, to embrace this technology um, 
and get more than an 80% premium. Here's some examples around the food safety as well. So Fonterra, um, close to home for me, but yeah, this is what they're doing, just proving um, you know, where that's come from, that it's an authentic product, baby formula, and that's very important to mums. They've just got one problem. When we're in China, um, if you scan this barcode, you could get it in English and you could get it in French, um, but you couldn't get it in any other languages, so they need to, a few things to work on there. Here's another example of uh, blockchain. So this is to do with the, the labour side. So we've learned, you heard yesterday about you know, the, how we're paying our staff. So this is to do with coconuts by a company Provenance, who's using a, a form of uh, blockchain to, to prove what that farmer got paid for those coconuts. So if you are consuming that product, you can then scan that and make sure that the person who produced it actually got a fair, fair price for that product. Vice versa, as a, as a farmer, you can also see what your product sold for in the end market. So um, if you've got a processor that's selling your, you know, if you've got choice between processors and they're selling it for this price and the other processor's selling it a lot more, um, I know who I'm going to be sending my, um, my stock to. One thing on this though is it's important, you know, in Australia and New Zealand we have uh, minimum wages. Um, there's been a bit of controversy locally and, you know, first to put our hand up in the dairy industry is we don't always get it right in terms of the right uh, wage records. Um, you know, you do need to get your ducks in a row back at home because, you know, if it's not, if it's showing, you know, our minimum wage might be $16 an hour. Um, in Brazil it might be $2 an hour. Um, if they're paying their guy four and we're paying our guy 14, their one's a, a lot better product um, from the consumer's um, point of view. So just into some recommendations. Um, so firstly, you know, mobile first. Uh, in Western cultures, we a lot of us do build our, our websites or our online offering to sit on a desktop computer. Uh, most people in these emerging markets have never seen a desktop computer, but they've seen a smartphone. So we need to be making sure it's, uh, it's mobile first. Um, the payment systems, uh, the, the most common Western form of payment is credit card. Um, we love to, to pay for stuff and uh, worry about you know, where that's coming from later. Um, but in these developing markets where a lot of us are targeting Southeast Asia, China, um, even Japan, the most common form of payment now is peer-to-peer -peer, uh, payment services, so through their phone. Um, many of them have never had a bank account before. Um, but they, they can pay on these phones. So you know, we need to be making sure that we can accept these form of payments. And the good news is that you know, your Alipays, your WeChats, your GoPay in Indonesia, um, as a New Zealand and Australian business, you can set your website up to accept these payments. Um, so your consumer is then paying in their local currency, um, and it's a seamless experience for them, um, as Toby was talking about when they're purchasing, purchasing products. Um, we need to be making sure that we're thinking business to all rather than just business to business and business to consumers. Um, you know, the next generation of business owners are going to be the millennials, the, you know, the eye brains, the generation Z, you know, they, they do everything on their smartphone so they want to be able to um, do business as well. But the offering will be different. So you know, Toby talked about emotion. Um, as a business to consumer transaction you're very much selling a lot on emotion. Um, but when it's business to business you need to have your facts right. You need to have a lot more figures. Um, you need to be able to accept you know, transactions from multiple people within the same organisation. So it is, it is an online offering, but it's a different form of offering. Um, the retail thing, and I'm not sure um, what Australia's offshore retail um, you know, presence is, but in New Zealand we do not have a lot of uh, retailers in China, for example, um, to sell our products. So we are selling through third parties, but we do have a lot of these. So this is actually the Australian um, in Shanghai where it's uh, you, know, you can come and meet potential customers, so an opportunity to do business uh, called a hub. Um, but what I recommend we need to do is actually with these hubs is we need to have an opportunity to have our products there. Um, kind of like a bit of a, a theme park, you might work with um, Tourism Australia or someone like that. So you've got people coming in seeing what you can actually do in Australia. Um, you might have some experiences there but also at the same time they're trialling your produce and there's a, a convenient wee QR code that says oh here's where you can buy it and we'll have it delivered to your door um, by the time you get home. 
Uh, I talked a little bit around these, these big players. So here's a you know, sort of a sample of the big e-commerce players um, around the world. And this probably sort of follows on quite well from Toby's presentation um, around these luxury brands. So you know, we want to be a premium producer and a premium product. And you'll see a lot of New Zealand, I think there's a lot of Australian products that are now selling on the likes of Alibaba and JD.com and um, you know, Amazon through Amazon Fresh through um, you know, those sorts of mediums. But you know, it's still going to be commoditized. Um, you won't see the luxury brands um, putting their products on these websites very often. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, I don't know about anyone in this room, but if I go to Ali, AliExpress, I'm going there to get something because it's cheap. Um, I'm going there, I, I know it's probably a fake uh, from buying you know, something that, a clothing brand or something like that, but I'm probably not that worried because it's cheap and it's, you know, that's why I'm going and buying this. So we have to make sure that you know, we are actually, you, we need to access their customers, so it might be a small offering. So for example, we might put a few infant formulas on, on those websites, but we need to be able to have a QR code that then scans back to our own offering. And I saw a lot of luxury bands similar to the ones Toby met with that had done just that. Their biggest growth now is in their own online offering, not through these websites. Um, because of the customer as well, the customer has a relationship with, say, Alibaba. They don't have a relationship with you, and they don't have a relationship with your product. So as soon as Alibaba launches a competitor's product that's cheaper, they're going to go to that. Um, so yeah, so I mean, in some, a little bit in summary is you know mobile e-commerce is disrupting um, you know traditional supply chains and particularly in the food space. Um, this is a, a quote that was at Ali, Jack Maher at Alibaba is around you know the, the next generation. I think we need to the generation Z or I brains as, as they like to be called. They they only know smartphones. Their whole life they've grown up with a smartphone in their hand, and that's only going to get worse or better or however you want to look at that. So you know by 2030 most of most of the business owners in China and, and consumers will you know, want to deal on a smartphone, so we need to get these platforms ready um, for that. And I mean, speaking of mobile phones, I, I came across this the other day actually, which was sort of interesting. So this is what phones used to look like um, the last time they won the Blair's Low, so I thought I'd slip, slip that one in there. Um, and I saw Lara had a, a, a slide predicting the Wallabies to win the 2023 um, World Cup, so I guess you've already written off uh, next year. Um, but, you know, I think one thing, if I was going to sort of have a bit of a key takeout message is, you know, farmers, and particularly the rural community, and I imagine it's similar in Australia as in New Zealand, we're very conservative. Um, we've gone down this commodity track with our products because there's lots of buyers, there's lots of sellers, and you know, if we want to have our products sold, it gets sold. It's just not always at the price that we would like. Um, there's a bit of market f fluctuation, but we've very much avoided, avoided the niche markets and the, the value add because the risk of products sitting on a port with, without a home um, um, and you know the chance of that being ruined is is too high, and particularly when we've got cooperatives that have farmer directors, you know they always want to take the safe option because if they trial something and they lose a bit of money, as you're seeing with Fonterra at the moment, everyone's calling for their heads. Uh, so I think mobile e-commerce provides that link. Um, it allows us to, to access these customers and know more about them than they know themselves um, before we've actually produced the product and, link, and there's a lot less competition in that space as well. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to thank Nuffield Australia for the opportunity to speak um, at your conference um, and also I'd like to thank uh, my wife Christina as well who's here uh, for her, her support over the last 18 months. So thank you.